Hi, I'm Dr. Lauren Spring. And I'm Dr. Sarah Kafashan. And this is My, My Favorite, Favorite Lesson. Lesson. Welcome back to My Favorite Lesson. My colleague and co-host here, Sarah, and I are very excited today because we are actually interviewing somebody who we know quite well. We have with us um, Executive Director of Teaching and Learning at Conestoga, Catherine Brillinger. Hi, Catherine. Hi there. Thank you so much for having me, Lauren and Sarah. Thank Great you. To have you. <laughs> yes, thanks for being here. Before we dive into some of these questions, um, can you just let our listeners know a little bit about your role at the college, how long you've been here, etc.? Yeah, absolutely. So I joined the college in 2003 as a full-time faculty member. I was teaching uh, communication slash ESL, and then I moved into interdisciplinary studies, um, became very interested in faculty development, started volunteering there. Then um, I was um, bored out from my faculty role and so became a consultant for faculty and then associate director, director and executive director and still having fun. Mm -hmm. And still teaching a lot along the way, right? Even in Yeah, your, yeah. I've taught almost every semester, even when I moved into administration. And even part of the role is teaching workshops and teaching mini courses. So wonderful. And as you know, so this season of my favorite lesson, we're really taking a look at faculty identity. So that's where these questions are going to lead us. <laughs> and I'll, I'll let Sarah start us off here. Yeah, we're so excited to have you, Catherine. Thanks so much. I think this is a great segue because I'd love to know first, what topics have you taught? It sounds like you've played numerous roles at the college. What have you taught along the way? Everything from very technical aspects of speaking English, like pronunciation and grammar. I can tell you how to analyze the past perfect mm -hmm. uh, up to very... Um, complex, nuanced subjects like intercultural communication, uh, user training for health informatics. So how do we train people to train users of technology? Mm -hmm. And um, in my role uh, as helping faculty develop a lot of intercultural skills and um, interdisciplinary skills, thinking about who we are in various classes. Amazing. Mm -hmm. So all, of all of those things that you've taught, could you pinpoint to, to one or, or two um, topics where you were taught to teach something that, you know, hit close to home, where maybe you felt obliged or like, you know, if you were shared some pieces about your own life and your identity, it would be inspiring. It would enhance student learning or faculty learning if you're teaching faculty. Can you share a little bit more about that with us, Catherine? Yeah, I found it very often helped to share something that I had experienced myself, being very careful to make sure it's about me and not about the profession or Canada. I say that because when I taught in link programs, which is language instruction for newcomers, you're often helping people navigate a completely new system. And, and when I started out, I would say things like, in Canada, we do this, mm -hmm. or in, um, you know, in English, we do this. And I realized very quickly, it actually alienated my students from me. But mm -hmm. when I said, I found that it works for me to do this. And in this difficult situation, I tried this. Then we were <clears throat> making connections that we needed to make and not telescoping away from each other. Yeah, yeah. That's so interesting. So you found ways of saying essentially almost the same thing, but in a way that really helped you relate to your students. Yeah, I yeah. think it's so important. And then later in teaching intercultural skills, many of the faculty in the group might be from other cultures themselves, different from my own. Mm -hmm. And so I never wanted it to appear that I'm describing something that I know and they don't know because maybe they actually know it better than me having seen it from outside eyes. So yeah, using a lot of caution in mm -hmm. the way I framed conversations and observations. Yeah, for sure. Can you tell us about any courses that you have taught, courses or topics that had particularly emotionally charged or complex content that you were teaching? Well, I think anytime we're looking like interculturally, I'm not meaning interculturally like ethnic culture. So mm -hmm. it could be uh, other aspects of diversity. So mm -hmm. for example, uh, two of my daughters would describe themselves as queer. Mm -hmm. So sometimes both in an ESL teaching context, when that's a very new concept for people, mm -hmm. I would have to be careful not to get emotional if anyone said something that made me feel rights are not being protected or, or there's a different opinion in other culture. And then, you know, seeing a very diverse class in front of me, sometimes I would worry about one student's comment when it's a difficult topic and how another student might feel about that. So, yeah, I think very often, no matter what we're teaching, it's sensitive to somebody or some people in the room. Yeah, yeah, that's such a great perspective, because even in topics that may not be emotionally charged, it could be emotionally charged for some students. Absolutely. Right? And yeah. we don't know that. We, mm -hmm. we, we think we know our students sometimes, but we never know what's going on in their lives. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. 
That's actually a really interesting segue into this next question, which is about sort of personal and professional identities, right? Just as we're saying, certainly students present themselves in a certain way in class and you might, you know, assume certain things about who they are, but what parts of their identity are beneath the surface? Um, and I'm curious in yourself, I mean, you just shared this about your daughters. Um, would that be something that you would share with this particular class while you're teaching? It's such a good question because sometimes I share it and sometimes I don't. Mm -hmm. And I look at what my relationship is with the students, like if it's week one, mm -hmm. that may not be something I share depending on the diversity of the class. But by week seven, I might decide to put that in to um, explain a bit more about myself and the world I want to live in. Mm -hmm. um, so it is strategic. And I do also teach faculty strategic disclosure in the classroom. So um, I'm metacognitive about what I'm doing and the decision making I'm making. So absolutely, I would sometimes share it the first day, perhaps if I saw a student in the class who was absolutely, um, there would be many aspects of my daughter's lives and my life. So like my daughters are biracial, mm -hmm. um, you know, two different religious backgrounds at play. Uh, gender, um, sexuality, all kinds of aspects. So I might think, oh, if I mention this, it might actually be very helpful. I'm making a guess. Yeah. I'm just mm -hmm. hallucinating. I don't know <laughs> really, but I see the students and I think, oh, there's a lot of diversity here. Let me share this to bond. And other times I might say, not yet, not ready yet, um, doesn't suit. So when I put pictures of myself at the beginning, they're, they're chosen based yeah. on the subject matter I'm teaching, who I think will be in the classroom, mm -hmm. uh, what I think might work. And sometimes I'll gloss over one and sometimes I'll sit on it and, and say, yeah, this is a good topic for today. Mm -hmm. And when you say, yeah, so sometimes that would be week one. If you sort of read the room and felt like, I don't think they're ready for this <laughs> part of me yet. Or, yeah. um, what would it be? Would it be, you know, to protect yourself and your family members in a way? Or would it be more for them? Like this is, you know, pedagogically, I want them to warm up to <laughs> these discussions. Yeah, not for my family members, because they're very comfortable with um, explaining and sharing and sometimes for me even oversharing about their <laughs> um, identities and their opinions. So I, I wouldn't be protecting them. In fact, I might be making them a little bit sad mm. if I was mm. withholding that information okay. for a reason. Right. It's more for my students and thinking, will this help us to build a relationship where we trust each other, in which case after that I can share more, or will this make them feel that we don't have as much in common? So I'm looking right. for things we have in common. Like if the students are um, from very diverse countries of the world, I'll try to show a picture of myself engaged in uh, work in Saudi Arabia or China or in a South Asian community in Brampton um, so that we can say, oh, we're all been exploring the world together, right? What have you seen? Um, when I have all domestic students who were born and raised in Kitchener, I might <laughs> choose different pictures at the beginning to bond, right? right? Myself in 1970 in the trunk, sitting in the trunk of a car or mm -hmm. traveling out to New Brunswick. So, mm -hmm. um, and then if I don't know who's in there, it's a combination of all of those things and then flipping through a little bit. And I mean, I've seen that cause I've been lucky enough to be in some of your courses and <laughs> workshops and things and how you do use personal photography quite a bit. And you mentioned this term, I just want to make sure. All our listeners know what that means, this idea of strategic disclosure when mm -hmm. teaching. Can you just say a little bit more about that? Yeah, so there's quite a bit of research if you go to the library database and look at it. And it basically says that there are some things that are absolutely important to share, like your struggles with the same subject matter the students are learning. That can be a very bonding um, thing to share. Mm -hmm. So uh, I taught linguistics. I really struggled studying linguistics at the beginning. Give a few examples of that. That's a, a good strategic disclosure for me, the first class. Um, but some of the research says if you um, share your sexual orientation at the beginning before trust is built, it's a, a bit of a 50-50 chance for how that will come across. So, mm. yeah, you decide what you're going to share on the basis of how, I think usually how it will help your students. But you made a very good question, does it help you? And that's always got to be a consideration for ourselves as, as faculty as well. Yeah, it's a bit of a dance. Huh? It is, it is. Um, and would you say there are parts of your personal identity that you have never shared sort of in, and you don't have to disclose what they are, but just that you haven't felt comfortable sharing with students or in a professional setting. Well, maybe if uh, when I didn't know enough about it, for example, I think my brain is quite neurodiverse. I've been learning that uh, more recently mm -hmm. uh, as I do some therapy with my daughters, which I'm totally comfortable sharing. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, I think if I had known that, I would have shared it before, but I, I didn't really know it. So now I'll share it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a lot of our own self-exploration, too. Mm -hmm. Right. 
uh, in the beginning, I didn't know about my own culture, having grown up in a small town in like Orangeville in the mm-hmm. 1970s. When I started teaching intercultural, I didn't know what to share about that mm-hmm. and how it impacted me and my behaviors. So, yeah, self-exploration is very important in order to do strategic disclosure. Um, I've shared things from I like going to topless on the beach, right, which is a real <laughs> shocker for some of the students mm-hmm. right, if they come from cultures <laughs> where modesty is a high value. So I would not share that first class. Right. I would wait until we've all adored each other for a few weeks, learned together, had some tough experiences, and then give a more full picture of myself. Shock doesn't usually work. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And do you find, you know, do do different parts of your personal identity come through when you're in the classroom versus when you're leading our teaching and learning team and have that Mm -hmm. executive director role? Yeah, that's a really good point because I think I'm freer in the classroom. Then I am with people I'm managing. So you should see how wild I am in the classroom. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, because I, I do have to manage your work, right? Like I do have to manage your work. And so I can be fairly free. But in the class, it's a different atmosphere. So I would say, yes, I'm, I'm a different person at home than I am in the classroom, than I am as a manager at work. So it's not like I think people can be themselves in all of those situations. They're a different aspect of themselves, perhaps. I curate, right? And I think everybody curates for those different roles. Yeah, so. it's a great way of putting it. Curate, mm-hmm. which part of your identity is going to, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know, pop out on the day. So it's not like I'm not true to myself, but I think I am strategically choosing. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious how this has shifted for you. Um, if there are parts of your personal identity or lived experience that you wouldn't feel comfortable sharing with students when you started in teaching that now you do disclose, you just mentioned, you know, maybe some neurodiversity, things you've learned about yourself. Um, but yeah, even more broadly, what, what has shifted over the years as you've become more of an expert teacher and more and more comfortable in the classroom? Um, yeah. Are there other parts that have come out? And also, have you ever disclosed something and then regretted it for some reason? So when I first started teaching, I was teaching ESL in a community setting. And I quickly realized that people from other cultures actually ask more personal questions than my, my culture, English speaking, middle class Ontario would have allowed. So um, it was a stretch for me back then to actually, oh, you, you want to know if I'm married, how old I am, mm-hmm. all, you know, all these personal <laughs> aspects. Um, so I started learning that it's a cultural thing and that some groups will ask some things and not. And that helped me to become more comfortable, I think, at the beginning. Uh, was a good experience. As time went on, I started to learn what worked and didn't work because I think it's a process of experimenting and then reflection on our teaching practice. So I would sometimes say, you know, I'm divorced. And then one student who was from Korea said, I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, interesting. When I share that information to a diverse group, some people will be sorry for me. Some people will say hooray, (laughs) um, want to throw a party. So um, I realized then it might not always work to share this particular thing with a group or it might. So uh, I'm still experimenting now. Let's see what I share today. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, this this notion of, you know, um, you talk about reading the room, right? And almost like, like we talked about, it's a dance between what you think the students need. But you have to have this idea in your head of what the students need to know, right? And and I assume that's kind of morphed and changed through the years, like you said, as you've become more reflective as, as, a, as a person, but also as an educator. And so, you know, thinking about this, you also have a, a role now as the executive director of teaching and learning. So you've had you know, the honor of, of, of interacting with a lot of faculty here. And, you know, how do you teach that to faculty? Because I know you teach some some fantastic workshops on strategic disclosure, risky business, that kind of stuff. Um, how do it's you not te- risky business. It's, it's risky things to say or do in the classroom. Oh, right, right. right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not it. Yeah. <laughs> um, how do you teach that, right? How do you teach faculty who are maybe newer in their journey or, you know, at a different stage of their journey and their self-discovery as well, um, to read the room and to know, you know, how to adequately share in a way that is going to be relevant and build connections, build that common ground with students as opposed to isolate. Mm -hmm. So I think, first of all, I want faculty to think about the fact that they are just hallucinating 
about the people in the room. It mm-hmm. takes so long to get to know someone you've known for 20 years and then you're always surprised anyway that I think we need to disabuse ourselves of the idea that we know our students. We absolutely don't know them and they change every semester and doesn't mm-hmm. matter who they are. We don't know them at all. At the same time, we can make some generalizations. You know, for example, it's not about the subject matter only. Students want to see you as a whole person in the world. They want to know they can trust you, that you can lead them, that you have ethics, um, that you're on this journey together. And in order for someone to believe that about you, they're going to have to have some information. So if you go in there, just I'm a subject matter expert and it's all about this particular course, I would tell faculty, how can it be possible? You know, in business or in other fields to be a leader, people need to know something about you and trust you. How could it not be the same here? So first kind of setting the field that, of course, Mm -hmm. is the subject matter plus your intent to teach and who you are as a person and uh, uh, as a teacher. So then once that's then the question is, so what can you share at the beginning, in the middle, at the end um, with your students that will help them to see you as a whole person in the world, as well as the person who will mark them and guide them. And um, it's a huge experiment. Mm-hmm. I, I, I say to faculty, make a list of things that you absolutely think you would never share. Make a list of things that you think students should know about you and see if you can move some of those things over with a partner. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, because maybe mm-hmm. those things you thought you ne- should never share. The other person would say, oh, wait, I didn't know that about you. If I had known that, I would have asked you this or done this. And then the things you think you should share, like I worked at this company for 10 years and this one for 20 years and I have a Ph.D. in X. The person might say, actually, that's not what I needed to know Mm -hmm. in order to know that we would um, be safe with each other. Yeah, because this is so interesting because there's there's a piece here around faculty needing, you know, we talk about trust, right? Trust between our students and our faculty. But part of that trust is credibility. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, you know, we see this where, you know. Maybe when you talk about those two lists that you talked about, one where that you would clearly share, if you ever looked at those lists and, you know, without sharing the details, of course, I'm sure you probably saw a lot of positive accomplishments of the yeah. things that faculty thought were appropriate to share. And the things that they may not share would be things that, you know, faculty might view as failures or like maybe the first time they they misunderstood something on the job or things like that. Right. So I'm curious here, you know, when do faculty know what they should share and when has you know, a threshold pass where enough trust has been formed that they can maybe switch to that other list. Yeah, I think the teaching is different from like being a manager of a group. When, when I'm teaching, there's almost an implicit trust that can get broken. Mm-hmm. So at the beginning, the teacher, the students see me at the front of the room assigned to this course, and they have faith that I must know something and be able to teach. I need to keep that faith. In a management position, you've got to continue to build that faith, faith and, and share over a longer time. So I think if, this, if the students see you there and you are able to mention that you have adequate educational qualifications, adequate industry experience, and even if it's your first semester teaching, that you've tried to work with the course and plan it really well, you're okay with students to a large degree. That's mm-hmm. not the case when you're going in to manage a new area. <laughs> right? yeah. I mean, there's a lot more suspicion. But you start mm-hmm. at a place of trust with students and then often, sadly, that trust gets broken instead of built. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so maybe if I can draw back into your own experience, when were times, you know, when you would think, OK, I'm going to share this or this is something I would share about myself that will help the teaching or, you know, so where you chose to share personally versus when you're like some more personal aspect needs to be shared here. But I'm going to go with a guest speaker. Or I'm going to go with a video instead. I'm going to go with a different voice that touches on this personal thing because I don't want to share myself, or maybe it's not a huge part of my own identity as the faculty. Yeah, I think um, if it's not part of my identity and it's part of the course content, then I would go with a video more likely than a guest speaker. My experience of guest speakers is often it takes too much time, too much organization, and uh, too much work for that individual to come in or to record themselves. Um, But to find a video or have that person do a video can be very, very helpful. Yeah, if I don't have the lived experience about... uh, what it's like to be a new immigrant, for example, Mm -hmm. it would be far better for me to find a clip of someone saying how hard the first two weeks were or the first six months than to do that myself. And that is important to bring other voices in. It's just the guest speaker is a lot of work for the individual. For sure. Okay. I'm going to have one more question before I turn it back to Lauren here, which is, would you mind telling us about a time where, you know, you felt 
you ever felt maybe you got this wrong, right? So you, you overshared or you didn't share enough. And now there was some, there was a disconnect or the trust was broken with your students. Um, you know, how did you navigate this? How did you course correct? How did that feel for you as the faculty? Well, the worst experience and one I still think about sometimes was I had actually asked the students to share. So it was a, a group of newcomers to Canada, mostly actually international students in that group at another college. And um, I asked them to share what they missed most from their homeland in Canada. And we were working on a particular grammar thing. So they were sharing very carefully. And a student from Korea shared that uh, back home, he had been able to eat live octopus. Right. Mm -hmm. And instead of thanking him for his contribution, I said I shared my personal opinion of that activity. And I said, that's so gross. And then I turned to the rest of the class and I said, isn't that gross? Right. Mm -hmm. So then everybody is with me against this person. Total trust breaker. Absolutely mm -hmm. inappropriate for me to have invited and then not welcomed. And it took me weeks to build back his trust. Mm -hmm. Right. Because in a culture where face saving is even more important than my own, I caused him to lose so much face. Mm -hmm. Right. So we have a responsibility as teachers in that sharing back and forth. Our own face is our responsibility, but the student's face is also. So, yeah, that was really unfortunate. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, you watch your students. Uh, we can watch every single student in the room at the same time. We've got the human capability and see when something that you've said causes their mouth to pull back or their eyes to turn down and try mm -hmm. and repair. So it definitely has happened to me. Mm -hmm. One of the things, you know, you were, you touched on already a little bit with photography and using personal photographs from your family mm -hmm. and other experiences. I'm personally very fascinated by this thing called aesthetic force. It's uh, I didn't coin the term. It's Sarah Lewis um, who teaches at Harvard and is also an art curator. Um, but it's essentially in some ways it's about beauty, right? And how sometimes we need something, whether it's a photograph, whether it's a work of art or, you know, the perfectly timed sort of video in the perfectly timed moment in class that can just really enhance learning in that way. Um, and, you know, we'll talk more about this on future episodes because I'm a bit obsessed with the, <laughs> <laughs> the concept. But I'm curious if in your memory, if there was ever a moment um, while teaching where, you know, there was some sort of charged topic and you thought, okay, I understand this at this visceral level. I'm either going to, yeah, share this personal story or sharing would be too much. I'm going to bring in this video. Or is there a moment in your experience where, you know, there was kind of like a, yeah, an elevated moment like that almost where. So is, I mean, so first of all, I'm fascinated by the concept and I'm starting to think about that. But uh -huh. um, so a moment in the classroom where I've realized there's been a, um, a faux pas or a disintegration of the atmosphere and I've decided to recalibrate by bringing something. Not necessarily. It could even be like in the lesson planning phase, right? Oh, if yeah, you're looking at sure. your curriculum yeah, yeah. and you're like, okay, this week, you know, week three, we've got this unit outcome yeah. that's really charged. I'm going to do 100%, this. hundred percent. Yeah. So when I inherit a deck of slide, a slide deck, which is often happening, I teach organizational behavior, for example. So I've got a, a slide deck given to me. And there's not enough beauty in it, perhaps, because that's not the job of the person who developed it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yes, I will go like to the second slide and I'll insert a picture, perhaps, of my garden, me sitting in the mud in the garden. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, but I've got to always it's important that I tie it into the subject matter. Yeah. Right. So um, maybe I'm talking about leisure time and work time. Right. Um, so I would never randomly put something beautiful in. Mm -hmm. I have to have some kind of conceit attached to it. Yeah. Right. And so absolutely, yes, I think, OK, if I put my four daughters here with all of their similar coloring and absolute beauty mm -hmm. um, and I talk about the cultural dilemmas that they've had, then it will both bring beauty and a topic in. And then I'll often say to the students, does anyone have something on their cell phone that they want to share that reminds them of this situation? And mm -hmm. guaranteed somebody will say, here's my puppy right? <laughs> all right, or here's my child or here's my uh, garden, whatever. So I, I think it's really important if the faculty share something that they invite always for someone else to strategically mm. disclose because there will be that student sitting there saying me too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's lovely. I like that. I want to see that garden picture now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the things, I mean, even I have not been working in higher education as long as you have, but even in my, you know, close to decade, um, teaching in post-secondary, I've seen a real shift with respect to programs offered, courses offered, the types of faculty and perspectives that 
the higher education institutions are seeking, right? So I'm thinking particularly of things like Indigenous studies courses, right? For a long time, we know textbooks were very problematic. Certain type of history was taught and there's been this revelation <laughs> should have come a long time ago of like, wait a second, we need more Indigenous voices and we need programs that show, you know, this particular perspective. Um, I shared in my first episode of the season interview with Sarah about teaching in mad studies and, you know, this kind of critical look at psychiatry that had never been in higher education before, really, um, at least not labeled as such. And so with that, I'm curious in your role, just having been at the college for so long and also connecting with so many faculty, have you seen any tension with that, right? If we're bringing in people with certain lived experiences saying this is almost a, you know, a criteria for you to be considered qualified to teach this content in this course. And then also what that does to them as a person, like how much of themselves are they bringing in and navigating and, um, yeah, just curious on your perspective on that, right? I see the pros and then some of these these tricky parts of it too. Yeah, I think it must be very exhausting for people who have to bring that much of themselves to their role, right? So um, if I were Indigenous and I have that dual role and mm. mom's dual responsibility given to me in the teaching to represent my entire people and to teach the subject matter and to, for example, if it was a course in Indigenous history, dig into the most painful aspects of my people's history. That would be incredibly tiring and um, and asking too much, I think. I think we would have to be really, really careful. And I know in queer studies, it's the same thing, right? So you're teaching a particular subject and besides the mandate to make sure students meet the course outcomes, you were there because of your lived experience and expected to share some of that. So I think that that is a, a big ask, an important ask, though, because... I can't teach queer studies, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think even no matter how much I studied, I would not be the right person to understand. Um, even for intercultural, if I hadn't traveled as much or lived within um, such diverse cultures here within Canada, I would feel very fraudulent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, it's a really important question. I think we ask too much of people sometimes. And in those cases, then more videos, mm. right? More uh, action photos, more uh, guest speakers would help to share that. Um, what I guess I would call it a burden, that burden of um, your personal identity being so much on display because I can hide my personal identity whenever I want to. And a lot of it teaching is performance in, in many, many ways. So I've had an awful morning, but I go in and I'm like, OK, I'm going to make these people rock. Mm -hmm. And so um, I don't think you can do that if your whole purpose in being there is your identity, right? Like it's, it's would be hard to step away from that. So yeah, I think yeah, that's... Yeah, you can't really strategically disclose. It's just sort of there. It's there. Right? It's and there. Ever and, present. and people will tokenize all of the time, yeah. right? I mean, I think I did that when I first started teaching students from China. I would say, well, oh, how does this work in China? To somebody who's 19 years old and probably has absolutely no idea mm. how that works in China. So... I think we all run the risk of tokenizing that individual as well and expecting them to know far more than they would from their individual experience. Yeah. And that's really interesting what you're saying, this idea like tokenizing, because it's it makes somebody almost like, you know, invisible and hyper visible at the same time. Right. If they're supposed to be like the representative for their culture, yeah. um, but also invisible and like they don't they're not actually bringing themselves. Right. There's this idea of who they are, or what they represent at the front of the room or around a committee table. Absolutely. When my one daughter, who's a singer, was first, it was hide your identity as a uh, as a brown person and hide your identity as being so different and diverse and try to fit in with the mainstream. But now it's come on this panel and talk about being a person of color mm. in the music industry. Right. And and that's a like a continual almost demand on an individual who has a certain aspect of diversity. And how does she deal with that? Like, how does she feel about it? Or? I think so. I, we, we'd have to ask her. Yeah. Right? But I, I think that sometimes it is definitely a, a burden. She wants to just talk about her own opinions about the world. Right. And not always be representing all other people who are people of color or biracial, as it's her case is. So that's a that's a burden, I think, that um, overwhelms people. I what? think I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, it's such an interesting dynamic, right? Because on the one hand, you think we need other perspectives than what has been sort of the standard while at the same time. Yeah. Uh, that's, that can be trying and taxing. Yeah. Like on Thursday, I'll do a workshop for faculty in the health sciences about um, teaching students from India. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm definitely not from India. Right. And we could maybe try to find someone, but in some ways I can, I can curate and manage that conversation knowing the group will be diverse 
Yeah. So I can do that part. But obviously I can't represent what education or life or marriage or studying would be in India. So Mm -hmm. we can all do something as allies, but not the major part of that work. Yeah. Yeah. That's the idea of being, okay, yes, I am the best person for this job. And yet it's exhausting. (laughs) Yeah. 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 I mean, I'm so intrigued by this idea that, you know, Catherine, you said teaching as performance. And in the literature, we know that, um, you know, there are there are professions and jobs that uh, involve a lot of emotional labor, just part of the job. You know, I think of therapists or I think of, you know, paramedics. I've talked about that. But would you in your mind see teaching as a job that involves emotional labor or, as you said, teaching as performance? Because it's something that I think is tied to the area that people teach, right? As well as these identities that we talk about. Yeah, I think it definitely is tied to the area. So if I'm teaching grammar, mm-hmm. right, um, there's not a lot of uh, emotional labor involved in that. It can be almost clinical in its beauty, right? And it's still mm-hmm. beautiful, absolutely mm-hmm. beautiful to see those words dancing. But when I'm teaching intercultural skills, I know that, you know, for example, to new international students. So in organizational behavior, the last few years, all of my students have been from India and I'm teaching concepts, including intercultural communication and personality and all of those things. And I know there's a risk for the students and for myself that they're, they're going to go and try and live this at their part-time job right afterwards. Right. Mm -hmm. And that my advice or my explanation runs a risk of putting somebody on a wrong path. So there's a little more emotional labor there, but if I was teaching in community services, Mm -hmm. how to support um, equity seeking groups, and I'm from an equity seeking group myself, that would be where I think there would be a lot more emotional labor and frustration sometimes that things are not moving as they need to. The conversations would move in a different direction and performance is exhausting, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but trying to change the world is even more exhausting. Mm -hmm. Do you find that you say it's exhausting after you've been teaching for a couple hours straight? Are you done for the day? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. When I had four kids running around, I would be so hyped up when I first got home and Mm -hmm. then confused almost because it takes so much energy uh, Mm -hmm. to teach a three hour class or two, three hour classes, which is what we used to do back in the day. Often they're uh, divided up a bit more now. Um, So, yes, teaching is exhausting. I think if it's not tiring, something might be going wrong. Because mm-hmm. not quite as present as the, the yeah, job demands. Right. And you also have to be hyper vigilant watching your students because otherwise you don't know the impact of what you said exactly. and how to adjust it the next time if you're not watching everybody. On Zoom, it's so hard because you can't actually see, mm-hmm. yeah. right? You don't have that um, feedback cycle happening. I find that you were saying at the beginning about hallucination, like that's been amplified for me teaching on Zoom because mm-hmm. I, you know, it's one thing when I read body language and I feel like I get a sense, but when there's really just a few comments here in the chat and no faces. I I just hallucinate the whole time imagining what they're thinking. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I did a workshop yesterday. It was on, um, what was I doing yesterday? Wait, I was doing um, charisma, charismatic leadership Mm -hmm. tactics for teaching tough concepts. It's a really Mm -hmm. good one. Excellent workshop. Everyone should take it before Catherine retires. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I love that one. And, And yet only one person had their Zoom camera on. And Mm -hmm. um, people were even reluctant to put their microphones on and practice the verbal tactics. So it's more performance then. It's absolutely. I've got little yellow sticky notes reminding me to gesture and smile, (laughs) uh, even though nobody is watching me because I know it will help the students. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, on Zoom, I think it is um, if you do it right, it's more exhausting almost than being in person because you don't actually get gratification from adoration. Yeah, no, Mm -hmm. it's true. Yeah, the feedback, it's just not. Yeah. Well, yeah. the adoration too. And the adoration. <laughs> I'm not quite as expert a teacher as Catherine yet. I don't have as many adoring fans. Oh, I'm sure you do. Yeah. <laughs> I want to come back to this, um, this part that you shared earlier on about, you know, when I asked about when you thought you maybe, you know, misstepped in the classroom and you talked about this one student when you asked him to share. And given this context of you teaching, you know, strategic disclosure and this last one that you taught yesterday, um, How can we, you know, step forward when we've made mistakes? How do we recover with grace, um, you know, in a way that is not as exhausting, in a way that rebuilds that trust? What are some of your your ideas? How have you done it? And and so two part question here. How have you done it? And what do you say to faculty if this comes up in these workshops? 
I think the first thing, if you know something's not gone quite right, is to acknowledge it right then in the moment, right? I don't think I said that the way I wanted to, or oh, I feel that might have upset some people. Let me, let me retract and go back again. So watching the students and then immediately acknowledging, because otherwise you go home and wake up in the night and say, I think some people were upset with me. So when something's gone wrong, even if it's a quiz that everyone failed or something, right? Like something's gone wrong in the classroom, I think acknowledging it is the first step. I, I feel like something's not right here. Um, trying to think of ideas to fix it, engaging the group. What, what are your suggestions? What should we do now? Should I teach this over again and, and mm -hmm. see where it goes? Um, should we redo the quiz? So as far as I have um, the autonomy to decide, I think um, acknowledgement, reparation, um, but not deciding it on it yourself. Because what I think mm -hmm. might work might not be what the class thinks they, they need. Sometimes it's just a break. Right. I, I think I didn't say that right. I think I need a break. Let me get a coffee. We'll co come back in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So you can acknowledge and even exit yourself if you need to. Right. But dignity doesn't work. I would mm -hmm. say that to any faculty member standing on your dignity, pretending something didn't happen mm -hmm. when 35 people just saw it happen. Yeah. Let's not be foolish. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No. So just as we wrap up our conversation, Catherine, um, because this podcast is called My Favorite Lesson, I'm curious if there's a particular lesson you'd say you've learned about this subject, about how much of yourself to bring to class, um, how much of your own lived experience to share, uh, you know, to protect yourself, also inspire students, et cetera, um, throughout your years of teaching that you'd like to, to share with our listeners. Well, I guess anything that I'm willing to share, I need to give people an opportunity to share back. Right. Mm -hmm. Because at the beginning, I think I would sometimes show a picture or share something and I would forget to ask that. And the more I asked it, the more I saw that there is that one individual or two individuals who want to reciprocate. Mm -hmm. And so that opens up an exchange rather than just me disclosing to the students. Um, you had, I do have to be careful with that, though, because sometimes a student will share more than the class maybe is ready for because mm -hmm. minor minor kind of curated, right? Yeah. And uh, theirs may not be curated. So you've got to be ready to handle that um, at exchange and make sure everyone keeps face and keeps safe. Um, so I've learned to make it reciprocal. I've learned to watch the reaction of students. Mm -hmm. I, I've learned to um, have options mm -hmm. in my slide deck, right? Like maybe there's three pictures on that one slide and based on kind of where the conversation's gone, um, I choose a particular one to highlight. And I've also learned to make sure it ties to the subject matter. Yeah. I mean, you can tie almost anything to any subject matter, right? <laughs> um, but you have to be ready to say the linkage, right? Yeah. So that's something else I've learned as well. And then I've learned to have fun with it. Mm -hmm. And I think, I, I, what was that theory you brought in about beauty? Aesthetic force. Aesthetic force. Yeah, people have fun with it. Make it beautiful. Make mm -hmm. people remember it's a glorious world. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Catherine. Um, thank you so much for being here with us today. We really appreciate you being our first guest for season yeah, two. <laughs> thanks so much, Catherine. Oh, oh thanks to both of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was really fun. Well, we've come to the end of another episode of My Favorite Lesson, a podcast hosted by Teaching and Learning at Conestoga. You can find other episodes in this series and more by visiting Teaching and Learning at Conestoga College on YouTube and by following My Favorite Lesson on Spotify. Subscribe to be notified each time a new episode becomes available. And for 24-7 support for all things teaching and learning related, please check out our faculty learning hub at tlconestoga.ca. And with that, I'm Dr. Lauren Spring. And I'm Dr. Sarah Kafashan. And we'll see you next time.